Uh, this uh, presentation today is one of uh, a monthly series that we started sort of at once as we realized the pandemic was going to be with us for a while and we wouldn't be gathering. And it's been an opportunity for us to reach out to other organizations that share our, our values and our goals and our interests in textile arts. Um, and we imagine we will continue this into the foreseeable future because we've made a lot of new friends this way. Um, Warp is a catalyst for improving the quality of life of textile artisans worldwide. It's a global network um, of both individuals and organizations. And if you go to our website, which is weaverealpeace.org, you'll be able to find more about all those different organizations and individuals. Uh, you can watch previous presentations on YouTube if you've just learned about this or if you'd like to watch one um, again that you saw. Um, we have an artisan resource guide that tells you about uh, the organizations that our members are part of. And of course, we'd love to have you join us if you aren't a WARP member right now. And you can uh, do that by clicking on the membership button and that'll take you to the page where you join. Uh, so on behalf of the board and staff, Kelsey, <laughs> Kelsey is with me today, uh, with us every week or every month, actually. She's um, our administrative coordinator, soon to be executive director. Uh, so Kelsey, uh, thanks for being with us today and helping facilitate all of the technology that's needed for these kind of programs. Um, today, we're having a panel on the topic of, let's see if I can go to this, maybe it's registration, but I bet it'll tell me about the panel. Hmm. Maybe not. Whoa. What did we get? Mm -hmm. Continuing Textile Traditions, that's the series. Today's uh, panel is called Textile Tales, and it's about the value of stories. We have three WARP members who are each going to bring us uh, their own stories about their work, um, and they have happened all over the world. First, we'll have Pen Penny Drucker, and Penny's work has focused on uh, areas in the southeastern United States. Next, we'll have Alicia Rennie, who's uh, focused on central and northern Nigeria. And last, we will have Marilyn Anderson, who's both an artist, photography, excuse me, photographer and author, who's going to talk about the Maya of Guatemala. Penny, are you ready to uh, kick us off this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you're located? This, this afternoon, <laughs> I'm, I'm talking from New Hampshire and I will see if I can share my screen. Uh, yes. Okay, there it is, I hope. Um, Other speakers are gonna uh, start, stop their videos while Penny speaks, if you would be so kind. Okay, um, first of all, I wanna thank you very much for inviting me to participate today and I feel even more honored on uh, now that I am reminded that Phyllis was the one that got this started. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really hope that she's on the mend now. Um, I, I feel a little out of place because unlike other, other panelists today and many other WARP members, I have not been working directly with traditional textile artisans. <clears throat> For a long time, I was, in, I was immersed in the world of contemporary crafts and then in archeological detective work to learn as much as I could about um, the deep textile traditions of a part of the world where very few actual fabrics have survived into the present. So I do have some tales to tell and I'll touch on one or two of them in the next few minutes and then be ready to respond to questions about anything that does catch your interest. I started out as a hand weaver and embroiderer, learning by doing and sharing what I learned through teaching and then through writing about it. 
Within that field, I gravitated to anthropology and archaeology. Um, and my, uh, my, I'm reading this. I apologize. I'm, I skipped a sentence and I'm going to go back. I guess I'm nervous. Um, I went back to grad school in midlife and uh, gravitated to anthropology and archaeology, and then particularly was interested in archaeological fabrics and their makers. I've concentrated on southeastern North America uh, over the past thousand years or so. Um, in uh, uh, an archaeological culture that archaeologists call Mississippian, which extends over most of the southeast. This is a region where fabrics, basketry, um, and other perishable materials like wood do not survive very well in archaeological context because of the climate, which is hot and wet, and the soil conditions, which are um, relatively acidic. A very few complete fabrics did survive in places like dry caves. And some ceremonial sites have uh, produced fragments of complex and beautiful fabrics that reflect uh, elaborate regalia and belief systems. However, when I started out um, to research this, relatively little was known about the role that fabrics played in the, in the lives of ordinary people in the Southeast. Because trade cloth largely supplanted indigenous cloth making during European colonization in the region, there was far less direct information from the makers themselves than in places like Southwestern North America where um, the tradition of, of weaving um, and regalia has, has continued unbroken into the present. One of my mentors in grad school, whose research included salt making processes in, in Southeastern North America, knew I had a background in hand weaving and suggested I take a look at the large utilitarian bowls that were used to boil down saline water to make salt. Many of them had deep impressions of fabrics on the outside. Mm. These fabrics could be closely examined by using clay, latex, or other materials to make impressions of the textile impressions, producing what are called casts of fabrics. In my initial research, I analyzed over 1,500 casts made from pottery sherds excavated at a village near the confluence of the Ohio and Mississippi rivers that was occupied uh, about 1,000 to 700 years ago. And any of you from the middle of um, the United States today will recognize that is the place that was devastated by tornadoes last night. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm keeping many friends from there in my thoughts and hope they get through okay. But back to archeology. span uh, For um, comparative data to the textiles that I studied at Wycliffe, Kentucky, I analyzed smaller collections of casts and fabrics from other contemporaneous settlements around the Southeast. I discovered a huge variety of fabrics, most of them based on twining, but with some knotting, interlacing, and interlinking as well. And many of the casts were clear enough to get a very good idea of the types of fibers used in the yarns. And these turned out apparently to be mostly plant fibers, but there were some that looked like they could be um, animal fibers. The variety of structure and scale indicated that these fabrics were not produced specifically for making pottery, um, but were intended to fill a variety of functions in the life of the village. And I, I also noticed as I looked at 
at all of these, I often came across torn fabrics, holes in the fabrics, uh, missing threads. So it really did seem to me that these were older, older pieces of cloth that were being used incidentally in, in pottery making. Through, um, let's see. Let me ask you a question, Penny, while you're taking a little pause. Sure. Uh, one of the um, people attending today has asked about sprang weaving and was curious about whether you'd run across that in any of your investigations. You frame weaving? It's called sprang, S-P-R-A-N-G. Oh, um, there are, uh, it is not anything that, that I, was able to verify um, from impressions on, on pottery, um, but uh, sprang might have been used in the Southeast um, before the Europeans came uh, it, uh, or not. There are finger woven textiles that, that could have been made by sprang, but um, I, I don't know of any firm evidence. Okay, thank you. Okay. And just while I've interrupted, if anyone has a question, feel free to type it into the chat and I'll ask Penny if it's relevant to the point she's at in her presentation or else I will hold them to mm -hmm. the yeah. end. Okay. Um, oh, there's someone else. This is kind of relevant to the current slide. Can you tell us why the fabrics were used on pottery? Were they decorative or did they serve a function? Um, the best, uh, there are a lot of theories. Um, the best theory that I know of, and this has been verified by uh, experiments in making pottery, um, is that these were used to line the molds in which these bowls were made. They were not made like by coiling, as some pottery is, but they were, they were made in molds that probably were, were uh, holes in the ground. And uh, the theory is that the textiles were used to line these holes and help to lift the bowls out um, mm -hmm. before they were completely dry. Um, and that's, that's what I tend to believe myself, um, particularly since the impressions are so deep, it, it really looks like the, the um, clay was pushed into them. And then it would be logical that the, if the, the textiles were still there, they could be used to lift out these big things that uh, often were more than two feet in diameter at some places or, or less, but they, they could have been pretty heavy. Okay. Um, through, through measuring yarn structures and sizes, and fabric structures and densities and complexity, I could statistically analyze the body of fabrics from um, the village of Wycliffe and make comparisons with those from other settlements. I used many types of comparative evidence to determine the likely functions of these fabrics. Okay. Um, and some I found exact, almost exact matches for um, so I used uh, uh, archaeological and ethnographic museum artifacts from the southeast, including this one and a mat that was found in the same place, um, and also from adjacent regions like the northeast. And um, contemporaneous depictions of garments. These are mostly men, probably mostly warriors. And also um, I used drawings and accounts um, by very early European chroniclers. From the evidence of fabric structures, selvage, now this is, I keep advancing this and I don't want to. Okay, there we go. Um, from the evidence, evidence like this, the starting edges, the side edges, the finishing edges, the structures of the fabrics and, um, and the fabrics 
themselves, how they were made, I was able to hypothesize um, the, uh, the, the tools and methods that likely were used. I'm gonna see some of my slides over and over again, I think. Um, tools and methods that were likely used in, in the fabric construction uh, in the region. Um, and it does seem as though weft twining on free hanging warps was the major method, either in, a, in the, the round, like uh, the example I show that is uh, for making a bag, uh, or as large flat pieces. Um, this definitely appears to be the norm in the southeastern uh, uh, North America. There is no evidence that anyone's found to date of heddle assisted looms um, in this region. The statistical data plus replication studies, now we finally get to this one, um, made it possible to do the sorts of time studies that modern weavers carry out to determine how many hours of work go into particular products and to use this to determine the socioeconomic value of these fabrics how much of a woman's year might have been spent producing fabrics for her family and for the community, how important such products were in the larger economy, and whether they were made by specialist artists, craftspeople, or by ordinary people as part of their daily lives. The data also could be used to trace where particular specialized types of fabrics were made and instances where they likely were traded far from their, or exchanged far from their points of origin. All this from pottery shirts. Um, over the years, it's been my aim to use these very, very small bits of textile evidence um, to try to bring to life their makers and the world in which they lived and to demonstrate and share their significance with archaeologists, most of whom when I started out were male, uh, and non-archaeologists alike. Um, I'll stop here, but um, I will be happy to answer questions. Okay, very good. Thanks so much, Penny. We're going to hold the questions until the end at this point and then go on to the next presenter. which is Alicia, Alicia Rennie. I realized I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Judy Jetson. I'm a former board member and um, just silly enough to say I like moderating panels and be glad to do it. So that's why I'm here with you today if we haven't met before. So Alicia, please. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Yes. You sound great. Okay, good. So I want to thank you all for coming and wish you a good afternoon. Um, my discussion begins with my findings from my PhD research um, in central Nigeria, um, which is published in my book, Cloth That Does Not Die. And this is the cover here. Um, I will also present findings from my recent edited volume, Textile Ascendancies. Um, in which the contributing authors examine handwoven and embroidered textiles from the cities of Zaria and Kano in northern Nigeria. In both books, a general decline in handwoven cloth production um, is discussed, although there's a demand for particular handwoven and hand embroidered cloths, which continues. Page down. How do I go down? Kelsey. Do you have, uh, do you have a, um, if you look at your keyboard, try just the over arrow, Alicia, and see if that moves you through. Over arrow. Or the down arrow, just. Um, I did, yeah, I did, it's not working. Enter. Oh, or if you just click the, click the screen where you see your slide, will that move you to the next slide? Maybe. No. Oh, it did. Okay. 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 All right, um, so I'm also going to discuss two articles um, that I've published 
And um, one is called Traditional Modernity, and it's about how Ikiti Yoruba weavers, um, women weavers, shifted from hand, woving, hand weaving on broad vertical looms to narrow horizontal looms. And I'll talk about that. And also, I'll talk about new technologies of machine embroidered robe production. And this is in Northern Nigeria. And as you can see, he is not hand embroidering this robe that he's making. He's using a sewing machine. All right, so these are the areas where I've done textile research in Nigeria. Here's the country of Nigeria. Here's Nigeria and West Africa. And um, the Buno Yoruba people live in this area here and it's very rural and isolated. Um, and then I moved over to Akiti and I was doing research there. And then I got a Fulbright to go to Zaria and I began doing research there. And that's when I discovered women doing, women doing hand embroidery, which I've done a lot of research on and also research in Kano. So um, I'll start with the Buno Yoruba hand weaving because that's where I did my um, PhD research. And they've done, this area is renowned for several different types of hand weaving. One is plain weave by women on a horse, a vertical loom, a wide vertical loom. And here, this woman is wearing a uh, traditional, hunt, what they call woman's hunter shirt. And it has med medicinal objects on it. It's for her protection. Then um, this is another type of cloth that they weave in Bunu. Um, it's, a, it's called Asho Igpo, and I'll talk more about that. But it's, uh, there are four different types of Asho Igpo cloth. They're woven by women. And you can see there are two of the, two, two of the four are narrow strips, and then two others are, strip, are cloths that are made by joining the strips. And these are on display for funerals. So, um, but one of the things I discovered when I went um, to Bunu in uh, 1988 was the extraordinary importance of traditional marriage for women there. And it was part of ethnic identity. Bunu Yoruba women, they wanted to do um, traditional marriage even after they'd had children and were actually older. They had, but before they could do it, they had to have one of these Adolfi cloths. And these are, Every woman that was doing traditional marriage, she had to own her own cloth. Other cloths, people were borrowing them from people that had them. But these ones, everybody had to own their own. And that meant that I saw people weaving these cloths when I was doing my field research. And in this photograph, this is a really extended, traditional marriage takes a long, technically it's three months. It's not every day, but it's a long process. And one of the things, there's a different task that they have to do say every week or so. And one of them is the trip to the market. And here they are at the marketplace here and they're performing the trip to the market. And another task that women had to do was taking water around the village and you would take it to different households and give them water. And here's the bride here that was doing traditional marriage and you see she's got a pot with water on her head. And here's a woman that did, did traditional marriage, I think two or three months before that and she was accompanying her to give her sort of moral support. And here I am a long time ago. <laughs> they were greeting me. Another type of um, cloth, aside from marriage cloths, are handwoven white spirit cloths. And in this picture, um, these are all white. And um, Deborah Kolawole was the, the head of the women's spirit group in this village. And here she is tying um, white cloth on this little girl. This is the granddaughter of these two women here, um, who, who was apparently, um, her spirit double was troubling her. She was sick and it, it could have possibly been malaria, but um, they were giving her, they were appeasing her spirit with white cloth. Um, and this is the Asho Ikpo cloth that I mentioned, the masquerade, the um, funeral cloth here. And it's also used um, to make masquerades. And what's interesting about this is this is commemorating the death of a chief and masquerades are associated with the spirit world. So there's a connection there. So um, these Asho Ipo cloths are woven on a vertical 
vertical loom, but it's fairly narrow compared with the other um, claws that are woven by women. And you can see that on she's using the woman, the weaver here is using a um, a rib, an animal rib, to use as to prick up the threads to make the pattern. And there's supplementary weft um, warp. There's supplementary heddles to help make the pattern with this supplementary weft pattern weave. So we're going to move over to um, just west of the Bunu Yoruba to the Ikiti Yoruba. And this is um, an interesting um, uh, occurrence that happened when I was there in 1992, was women were starting to weave on vertical looms. And um, or not vertical, horizontal treadle looms. And here is the teacher and here are her apprentices. And what was so attractive to women like these young women was they had some elementary education. They'd gone to primary school. They didn't wanna weave in an old fashioned loom like their grandmothers did. They wanted a more modern loom. And here, this is what they were doing. So um, these are some more of these um, looms that these young women were weaving on. These were the um, horizontal narrow strip treadle looms that were associated with being educated and being modern. And what's interesting too, is that um, in a Kitty Yoruba area, but this, this has gender Im implications since it was men who formerly wove on horizontal looms and women on vertical looms. As men took up other occupations, women began weaving on looms associated with men and modernity. So you see that here. Okay, and now we're moving up north to um, Kano State. And you can see a man weaving on a vertical, no, horizontal, I keep getting these confused, a horizontal loom. And this is called a Mudakari treadle loom. And what's interesting too about this is this was actually modified from a narrower loom, but they started making them wider so that they could weave more material more quickly. And the types of cloth that were woven on this um, Mudakari loom are white just plain white cloth and also um, white cloth with colored supplementary weft inlaid patterns that are attractive to members of the Fulani ethnic group. This is a different ethnic group from the man who's, who's um, doing the weaving here, he's Hausa and they're Fulani and they, this particular cloth is very attractive to them. So um, Ahaji Kayu is um, the man shown here and he was the main um, the head of the weavers in this village. And here he's seen holding a mudakari cloth that he wove. And this particular cloth is worn by young Fulani women when they give, after they give birth, they, they give birth in their, for their first child in their parents, in their parents' house. So after they've given birth and they're going back to their husband's house, they wear this particular cloth to sort of announce to everyone that I've given birth, I'm going back to my husband. So, um, these cloths have a lot of significance to Fulani people. Um, while there's still demand for these pattern Mudakari cloths, the supply is limited. Ahaji Usman said that it was becoming increasingly difficult to get young men to weave them in his village. And it's partly that hand weaving was seen as old fashioned. Um, young men didn't want to, to be doing this, it's hard work. However, there are other sources of demand for different um, handwoven cloths in Kano State, um, and in particular by the royal um, by the royalty. And this here is the Emir of Kano, um, Muhammadu Sanusi II. And he's wearing, if you can see, these are different strips of narrow strips of cloth, uh, the robe he's wearing. And um, this the, the cloth was actually probably made in southwestern Nigeria. Um, but they were able to access the cloth and then made it into a robe. And then this particular cloth is really, this is a detail of a robe, also owned by the Emir of Kano, that has unbelievably narrow strips. I think you can see that detail here. I think there may be one to two inches wide. And those are woven in uh, a town that's not too far from Kano, and then also embroidered with wild silk thread in traditional patterns in Kano. Alicia, there's a question here um, about what fiber was used. 
I'm not sure that she's referring to this one though, because you just said that was wild silk. In general, it was cotton. Okay, thank you. They grew cotton in this area and actually in the South too. Okay, um, so we're moving on to another shift. Um, and this shift is similar to the shift that we saw in a kitty where women were taking out men's horizontal narrow strip man weaving and may be seen in, this may be seen in hand embroidery work in the town of Zaria in Northern Nigeria. And um, as this woman is saying, uh, I started doing Dinky Hano, this means hand embroidery in 1972. Um, women weren't doing this work then, it was men's work. And she would look at her husband's work and she really admired it. And these small boys would come to her house to do it. They were just sitting around doing embroidery and they would show her how to do it. And so she learned how to do embroidery both by um, the help of these young boys and also by looking at her husband's work. And now she's a great hand embroiderer. So, um, What's interesting about this house's situation is gender ideology was associated with particular types of hand embroidery and machine embroidered work. So um, many men now embroider robes with sewing machines and design work. So here is a man using the sewing machine you saw before. And then here's a, a man that's drawing the design on the, on the robes that this man will be sewing. Um, so men were, are still doing embroidery, but it's machine associated with machine work. Women, however, have started to take up hand embroidery. And those of you who are familiar with the Weave a Real Piece Warp auction that took place earlier this year, um, you may remember that some of the items were sent by Queen Amina Embroidery, a nonprofit organization that represents a small group of 25 women managed by Hassana Yusuf. And here's Hassana here advising one of the Queen Amina embroiderers about a particular um, um, garment I think she was embroidering. Here's another Queen Amina embroiderer. So um, this, this project is ongoing and um, it provides income and an outlet for hand embroidery work of Zaria City women. So um, these, uh, I have a, there, there are several articles that I've published about these various aspects of hand embroidery, hand weaving in Nigeria. And if you're interested in anything about hand weaving or hand embroidery in Northern Nigeria or Central Southern Nigeria, Southwestern Nigeria, please feel free to email me and I'll be in touch. Um, just to end, this is a, a weaver in Zaria City. This is probably the last hand weaver in the city. You can see she's weaving on a traditional um, vertical loom for women. And you can see that she's elderly by her white hair. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Alicia. That was fascinating. Uh, one question before you depart. Mm -hmm. Is any of the um, yarn hand spun or is it machine spun? It depends. You know, um, do you remember in the very beginning, I showed a slide of a woman that was wearing a women's hunter's, uh, women's hunter's cloth and it had fringes at the bottom, white fringes. That was hand, that was hand spun cotton that was hand woven. Um, I don't know if I can go back is the problem. No, that's okay. It was more a matter of curiosity, yeah. I think. Yeah, and um, the hand embroidery that was done um, by the Akiti Yoruba weavers, I believe that was that was machine machine spun cotton that was imported, and then they hand wove it. Okay, well, thank you. So stop share. Yes. All right, all right. So we have one more story to share today, and that would be Marilyn's. Hello, hello, hello. hello. So, okay, we can start. And um, Kelsey's going to change my slides, so I, I won't have anything to do with that. I'll, I'll read a little bit, but um, I, I have a sort of prologue quote. The artist, if true to his or her vocation, 
recovers, recovers the past and explains the present. The artist is the true chronicler of who we were and where we came from. Culture in times of distress is not a luxury, but a life raft. That's, those are words by Chris Hedges, who used to write for the New York Times. And, but before I get started, I want to do quick thanks uh, the people who helped me do my last book, particularly. Um, um, Christine Eber was a um, wonderful, wonderful editor. My husband helped me in certain things and my daughter and Deborah Chandler, I have to thank too. So anyway, I, I don't see myself on the split screen. What should I do? We, we can see you, Marilyn. I think that everyone can see your uh, PowerPoint and then you and, as a thumbnail. That's fine. So I'm going to start reading a little bit and then talking more, I hope. When I was asked to participate in this panel, I first thought, just talk about my last book, Guardians of the Arts, Guardianes de las Artes, a bilingual book, but I decided there's a story behind each book as to how they grew out of one another. So I decided to do a short discussion about each book. So I'll start with the latest, which is Guardianes de las Artes. And if anybody wants to buy um, this book, uh, there's information at the last slide about how to get it. It's published by a Guatemalan, um, a Guatemalan uh, project. In it's called um, Ediciones del Pensativo. It's a wonderful, um, wonderful. Um, they do a lot of books, but they do an art series. And I feel very honored to have worked with them. It was a all women run press. So it's really something working with all women. And I loved it. Doing this book of 43 prints, oh, change slides. Change slide of 43 prints, woodcuts and linoleum cuts, gave me the chance to draw on all the research, photography and experience I have from living in Guatemala since the 1960s. It was very satisfying to do that. Change slides. I really made these, these woodcuts and linoleum cuts to encourage, uh, encourage support of the, these arts in Guatemala and to allow other people in other places to understand the the great treasure that these arts and crafts are. And I like to point, point out the, the connection of crafts to the environment. And I've changed slides. And I say, wonderful if I can encourage one person to use a handmade broom of natural materials instead of a plastic broom but I'm very interested in the connection between the materials for these crafts and the environment. Change slides. This is a hammock maker and um, that was an interesting project to try to make that clear what she's doing. <laughs> no, say, change slides. And then the other, the next book I'll talk about is Mayan Arts and Crafts, Artes y Artesanías Mayas de Guatemala. And it's in both the Spanish edition and in, Guat in Guatemala, it's available in, in um, Mayan languages. I have a few books of, of the Mayan and Spanish edition. But this was a very wonderful project to do. We, I worked with a 
a wonderful man and a press in, um, who designed it, Fernando Peñalosa out in California of the Yashte Press. And he, he was very encouraging. Change slides. So this is how it, the drawings look. And it's, it has 30 drawings. But we found that it was very appreciated. And in the end, it was very, over many years since it was first published in 2000, uh, we printed almost 24,000 copies. And we, we, we didn't charge, we got it out to schools and groups and so on. And people appreciated it. And it really is not duplicated by any, that, that's what I wanted to show too. These are just copies, but children really did like coloring it. And uh, it's really meant to help children to appreciate their own culture. And I thank the Mayan, the Mayan um, translators who translated Spanish into, into um, Mayan languages because they were very important. Eight different Mayan languages was printed in. <clears throat> One page would be all the Mayan languages and then the other page would be the coloring book image. The Mayan translators understood that their languages are cultural treasures and also understand that the arts and crafts are cultural treasures too. Change slides. We got it out into the country. People picked up boxes of it from the, from the person who was in charge. Change slides. And this book is another, another um, a whole other kind of project. Um, and I'll describe a little bit about it. It was a project that was very much a joint project with my husband, who was the editor. In order to produce this book, John Garlock and I, my husband, traveled to refugee camps in 1983 and later two other trips and finally published this book in 1988. The, we had the impetus to do it because <clears throat> of the war that went on especially in the 80s, from about 1980 to almost 1990, um, against Mayan people. They were accused of being communists and, and being subversives and so on. It was um, a very hard time. And around 200,000 people died in that war. And many people knew nothing about it. 50,000 people were disappeared. So doing this book was, had an urgency. And we also created an exhibit. And I made about four different sets of it because it, we traveled it by UPS in a big box and people put up the show very easily um, with Velcro on the wall and so on. But it was a big project. So change slides. This is one page from that book, Granddaughters of Corn. And it's it down here at the very bottom of the page are the names of women who were disappeared or murdered. And so under the photos of many pages, we have this running um, list of women who were disappeared. 
or murdered. And we found when we did lectures that people sometimes couldn't believe. They would not believe us that it was that bad. But there's all kinds of, um, all kinds of um, information about to verify the facts that we gave. We worked with Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, Guatemalan Human, Guatemalan Human Rights, um, and it's true. I mean, and so, so we had plenty of things to encourage us to do this work. Next slide. And this is a woman who was originally from the town where I lived longest in the 60s and 70s, Hakaltenango. But um, Hakaltecs were, were refugees too. You, you can get this book on the internet if people are interested. The printing was done very beautifully, very beautiful. Uh, the curbstone press went all out to make it a beautiful book. But I found it very emotionally difficult to write out all these names on the panels. The panels that went up on the walls were, you know, I would send, a, they were about three feet, four feet long, high, and maybe two and a half feet high. And they, with the names of the women who'd been disappeared, and I would, almost, I would almost begin to cry as I was writing out these names. And having done this book pushed me to want to do a coloring book. I wanted to do something that, that didn't involve so much emotion. And, but I'm very glad we did this book. My husband was to all of these texts below have um, sources there you can go back and verify where the information comes from. But, but it was a big project and it went on. I think the last time it was shown was maybe even 1990. I mean, it went on for quite a while. It traveled, traveled the country and actually went to, actually went to Mexico and to Canada and so on. So, it was uh, our, our effort. Next slide. This is in the book two, Granddaughters of Corn. And these are refugees. And part of, um, part of those projects generally involve textiles because many of the, many of the women who were, um, who, who um, were refugees were also weavers. And so that was a natural thing. I was going to say, go back one slide. And organizations would send the woven things from refugees to the US. And I got a big package of several hundred um, shoulder bags. And I thought, oh, how will I sell? And we would sell them and send the money back to the, the organizations. And I thought, how can I ever sell all of them? But I really did. <laughs> and I think I have maybe one or two left that I kept. But um, artisanal projects were a very important part of, of how the refugees uh, supported themselves and so on. Next slide. We're getting close to time to wrap things up. I will. Okay. I will go to backstrap weaving them very quick. Well, I'll leave out Guatemalan textiles today. That was a big, a big effort too, but I'll mainly talk about next slide. Backstrap weaving I did in 1975. And I call it the lesson of the loom for me. 
the necessity of a perfect bloom. Any mistakes or carelessness in putting together the loom results in a non-functioning loom. And I learned to weave from Mayan weavers. From the outset, using the backstrap weave, using the backstrap loom affected me very much. And I'm a slow learner, but it made me realize that um, the moral, well, the moral of the story is that it's possible to be make to make something very good working with one's weaknesses because I was not a great weaver. It took me very long to learn the different steps, but I was intrigued with with the wonderful, wonderful simple technology of the loom. But I had never used my brain to deal with warps and wefts, heddles, supplementary pattern wefts, and so on. Rather, I'm an artist, and you could say I had an instinct to paint and draw and make prints. But I loved using my brain in a whole different way by learning to weave. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. I taught school when I when we lived in Hakotanango. And this is a wonderful drawing that a child did. And this is my drawing from a series I did for a show quite a while ago, but I've had it in other shows. And I still love to draw, I still love to draw weavers and, um, and I have others in progress. But this is uh, someone from Aguacatan. Next slide. This is how to contact me if you feel like doing that. And um, I will, uh, you, I'm also, you know, I'm very interested if anybody has questions, there's a place on my website where you can send something, a question to me. But, but um, I hope somebody will buy the, um, my last book. Um, I like to send back money to my project, to the projects in Guatemala that I'm associated with. And you helped me to do that. So thank you. Um, I really loved doing this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marilyn. We're, we have time for a couple of quick questions. And I wanna go back to one that I missed earlier. And this was a question for Penny. Let's see. Do you know which indigenous people produce the textiles? And how do you know they were produced by women? We don't know for sure, but we do know the, um, the modern nations who lived in the Southeast and, and then were forced out of the Southeast. So probably um, a lot of the, con the ancestral connections were between people we know as, I don't know, uh, Cherokees, um, uh, uh, Osages who, who ended up in west of the Mississippi and some of the other uh, groups in the Southeast. But, but the definite connection between specific locations um, a thousand years ago and known people today is, it's, it's very hazy. And um, about women as weavers, I uh, search for the for all the evidence I could get, and and others, uh, other people working uh, in the same field have sought as well. There is precious little, but a few of the really early European chroniclers did talk about the weaving, weaving done by women, and at least one was fairly detailed. Uh, from southern Louisiana, there aren't any mentions of men uh, weaving. So 
that plus uh, parallels and uh, with uh, uh, women we knew who were making fiber bags in the Northeast and so on leads me to believe it was mostly women. I'm guessing that probably the men may have produced the knotted nets that were used to catch animals you know, and other things that appeared in the textile impressions as well. Thank you. That's a very a thorough and interesting explanation. I'm glad that question was asked. Um, Alicia, I have one for you as well. Um, for seams connecting pieces um, in a garment, what are the stitches and are they typically decorative or just simple? Oh, your microphone's off, Alicia. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, in general, they were just functional. They were just overhand stitches, simple overhand stitches that were connecting the strips. Um, and you can tell a lot of times when a newer cloth, they'll use machine zigzag to, to combine strips. But um, the older ones were hand sewn, overhand stitch. And I think maybe some of the embroidered uh, um, gowns, they did more decorative stitches, but I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question from Marilyn, uh, and it's about your book titles. The first book you showed us used the phrase artists and artisans. And then in the second one, you used also arts and crafts. And we're just wondering uh, how, you, how you decided to make those choices. What, what's the difference? Well, my, the last book we're talking about, right? The last book? Well, we were talking about the first ones you showed us in your presentation. Well, I think that um, I probably was influenced by Spanish. <laughs> Guardianes de las Artes. And, um, uh, and then I think, <clears throat> I think that Mayan Arts and Crafts, having, it was done in 2000. I might have changed, I might have used, um, artisans nowadays rather than craftsmen. I also want to tell you, Marilyn, that there are lots of comments about people treasuring your books and uh, thinking that the coloring books, loving seeing those in were in, in children's hands. Um, so a lot of the presenters have given comments about how much they appreciated your work. Thank you, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. It was an absolute privilege to do all these books. Mm -hmm. You realize how fortunate I am <laughs> to do that? So many people helped me. I had fellowships, I had grants, I had, you know, uh, I couldn't have done it without so many people helping. Well, I, I think that's true. And I have to say, you've all done fascinating work um, and I'm, I so appreciate the fact that you created books as a result, because that lets us all kind of travel along with you on the path. Um, the recording is going to be made available next week. So any of you who'd like to watch this again, uh, you will get a, an email from Kelsey telling you uh, when it's available and also giving you contact information for each of our presenters today.